Hey everyone, welcome to Psychology with my wife. I'm the wife. And I'm the psychology student. Welcome to episode two. (laughs) Almost screwed up there. So close. Second episode in, can't even remember them already. (laughs) If this is your first episode with us. Which it could be since it is only our second episode. (laughs) I'm going to go through some experiments, theories, and topics related to psychology and kind of put them in simple terms and hopefully have a fun and easy conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And I get the really fun part of just getting to sit here and listen to Julian talk about these different topics he's really passionate about. And then I ask him questions that hopefully will bring myself and some of our listeners a little bit more clarity on the topics. Yeah, so I just booked a vacation for Julian and I outside of the city at a really cute, cozy little place with a hot tub and a wonderful view. So we can't wait to get away and escape the city. (laughs) Yeah, it's like a, is it considered a staycation? I think it's a staycation. It's only an hour and a half drive, so. In another city, smaller city. (laughs) In a small city. Right on the, our property is bordering onto a forest reserve. So nice and (laughs) nice. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Noise. Um, Okay. I think that I need to start playing guitar again. I was thinking about it today and I was actually, I was just visualizing myself that I'm in the step in the process of getting myself there. I was visualizing playing today. So maybe tomorrow. (laughs) Anyway, let's get started. Today's episode, we're going to go over happiness. Hmm, I don't mind that. As per Gianna's suge- suggestion, yeah, that's how you say it. Yeah, that's the word. <laughs> so um, there's two ways that happiness is looked at in um, the academic realms. But for the most part, happiness is the search for positive emotions compared to negative emotions, mm-hmm. which would be like sadness. But the actual terminology used is, a, oh my God, I'm going to butcher this. Hedonic? He, hedonic? Hedonic approach? Hedonic? Uh, hmm. How's it spelled? H-E-D-O-N-I-C? Yep. <laughs> if you hadn't pronounced it more than one way, maybe I might have thought of it. I'm not sure. What would be like? I'm thinking of like hedonistic, right? Yeah. So I would say hedonic. (laughs) Someone in the comments, please save us if we're doing this wrong. I mean, I probably should have just like practiced saying it a couple times, but yeah. Eh, Professionals would do that. (laughs) We're not professionals. I have to make it clear that I'm not a professional. (laughs) Anyway, this approach is exactly what I just said. Aiming towards attaining pleasure, avoiding pain. The second perspective is the eudomic approach. Okay. This view on happiness focuses on self-actualization, meaning, and general well-being. And then well-being is then defined as a person's capability or functioning they have in day-to-day activities. Mm -hmm. So do either of those make more sense to you? So the first one's seek pleasure, avoid pain. Mm-hmm. The second one is find well-being, meaning in life, all that. Um, For me, I would say the second one feels more true to my version of happiness. I, I don't know. I was torn thinking about this because it's pretty hard to be happy when there's something in your day to day life that's bothering you. It's kind of like a, a needle 
poking into you. It's hard to be happy when that happens. Yeah, but I don't feel like I spend every day constantly, intentionally, consciously trying to avoid bad things. Like when I think about what am I going to do today, my thoughts are I want to like, you know, have a nice day, have positive mindsets. Like I'm not like, what am I going to do today? Avoid bad things. (laughs) (laughs) Not be in pain. Not let someone hurt me. Never stub my toe. Yeah, yeah. You do have some, I think the the second one is more permanent, mm-hmm. regardless if you agree with one or the other, because like, it's kind of, I don't know, I was thinking like the money can't buy you happiness kind of thing, mm-hmm. is that it's like the first term almost makes it seem like it's um, transactional. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but anyways... To kind of look into happiness, the first case we're going to go into today is the Rosetta Town Mystery. Mm. I'm actually familiar with this one because a course that I was a teaching assistant for at McGill University. Shout out to Dr. Sabetti. Love you so much. He's the best professor ever. And I loved working for him. And we actually taught this case to our students. So I'm really excited to hear your perspective on it. (laughs) Okay, I couldn't remember if it was your undergrad or if it was at McGill. Yeah, it was at McGill. So I will go through the description of the town and what happened in the town for all these who don't know about it. Mm -hmm. So Rosetta was a small Italian, Italian town in Pennsylvania with a population of roughly 1,500 people. The town was discovered in the 19... I'm just going to pause for a second. Is it Rosetta or Rosetto? Rosetto. Did I say Rosetta? Yeah. Rosetto is a small Italian town in Pennsylvania with a population of roughly 1,500 people. And that population has stayed static since, like, the 1950s. All right. Now it's more, but for a while... It was static. And the town was discovered in the 1960s by a doctor by the name of Stuart Wolf. He's the head of medicine at the University of Oklahoma. And what Wolf was interested in was in Rosetta. Rosetto? Rosetto. I keep saying Rosetta. (laughs) (laughs) I think first we should just clarify for people listening that we're calling it an Italian town because... It had a large immigrant um, population from Italy. And the town wasn't discovered by this doctor, but this phenomenon that was occurring in the town was discovered by him. Yes, yes. It wasn't yeah. some, it wasn't the city of Olympus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. People might be confused. Trust me, students were confused. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I could see students being like, what? (laughs) So what's interesting about Rosetto was that it it has an extremely low rate of heart attacks compared to the rest of the United States. Mm -hmm. So here's some facts that I actually found from the 1960s. So the 1960s actually had the highest rate of death from heart disease at almost 400 deaths per 100,000 people. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. Yeah, so in put it into terms of the entire population in the United States, around 300,000, that's 1.2 million people per year. So, it's a pretty big number. Mhm. And guess what the death rate was in Rosetto? Please enlighten me. <laughs> <laughs> so, the death rate for people over 65 was 1% in Rosetto. And the rest of the United States, it was 2%. So, again, that doesn't seem like much a big, much of a difference or a big number. But for 300,000 people, 2% is 6 million. 1% is 3 million. 300 million people. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We're recording this really late at night, so... <laughs> Numbers are hard. (laughs) (laughs) So, 
What's special about Rosetto <laughs> is that they did not seem to have healthy lives. When you looked at the habits, they contradicted what a healthy individual should be doing. Too much Italian pasta. Um, num, num, num. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> it's late. <laughs> Quite a few of them smoked and they drank a lot of wine. They also ate high-carb foods cooked in fats and with lots of cheese. So I could live there. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> we basically do live there. We live in our own mini <laughs> version <laughs> without the wine. Yeah. We live in a cheesery. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So the other thing, too, is that they worked. Um, it was near a slate quarry. So... It's like very dusty in those kind of places. Mm -hmm. Bad for the lungs. Mm -hmm. Real bad. <laughs> um, so obviously there should be higher rates of like disease in general for that. But mm -hmm. it actually um, makes me think of... And Did I ever tell you about that moon sand in Fort McMurray? No. I don't think so. So I was working at a company up north in Fort McMurray... And I was in a desulfurization unit mm -hmm. and there was this like byproduct that was everywhere in the whole building. And I called it moon sand because when you stepped in it, you didn't even feel it move away from your feet. And it was like, it was kind of cool. So I would like step in it, but. <laughs> <laughs> this is truly in. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> One small step for oil. No, like on the moon. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> but anyway, crickets. <laughs> they were. Uh, they, they have these things called norms in them. Mm -hmm. uh, normally occurring radioactive materials. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Good memory. <laughs> so they're really bad for you. And I guess there was like a bunch of people that got cancer in that unit. Oh, that's I was sad. like, I don't want to move. I don't want to work in this unit if mm -hmm. I'm. Like, intentionally putting my way there. So, anyway. <laughs> Good side story. <laughs> <laughs> so, why did Rosetto have such lower death rates due to heart diseases? Why? Why, why, why? Wolf believed that the lower disease rate was because of lower stress levels. Mm. What was different in Rosetto? The community was very close with each other. They cooked with each other, they worked together, and everyone res was respected in their own ways. So, I'd say that's pretty uncommon. Well, especially now. Like, it's interesting to me that this was such a phenomenon back in the 60s. When there was a lot of smaller towns, you mean? Or? Yeah, because yeah. I feel like, at least for me, when I think back to what I imagine life looked like in the 60s, I feel like it would have been really community oriented and you would have had a lot more like neighborhood cookouts and kids playing on the streets and all of that kind of stuff that you just picture when you think about that time period, which I know is not actually reality of what it is. There's a lot of really crappy stuff going on, but I just think about like the time before technology was so involved, evolved that people were spending a lot more time together in the community. And so it's just interesting that like I could see nowadays if there was a community that was like really actively together, that that really would stand out from how society is here now. So I guess what I think this is really speaking to is the idea of what community looks like in Italy and across Europe versus in North America, that there really was a substantial difference between how this community came together in this um, with their Italian roots versus how America. So even though Americans were maybe somewhat together on by our standards of things, they clearly weren't by the Italian or European standard. Yeah, yeah. Well, to be honest, like Clen Donald, I felt growing up there. Which is where Julian's from. <laughs> Very tiny <laughs> yeah, little hamlet or... I think 
there used to be 200 people there. I don't know. It's probably 50. School just closed down. But uh, growing up there, it felt like a pretty close community. Mm -hmm. Like everyone knew everyone. Like you knew that little old lady that lived on that one corner block and everyone went to go mm -hmm. see her kind of thing. And, but actually just, I was just thinking about it is that in our area, there's a lot of immigrants. Like my family's Ukrainian French, but around that area is a lot of Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's part of why is because there's a bunch of immigrants came over together and that's why they're a little closer. Yeah, so it's kind of the same idea then. Instead of it being Italian immigrants, it was Ukrainian immigrants mm -hmm. who came together to create this sort of community. Yeah. We should get someone to see what their health is like there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm feeling amazing. <laughs> I guess I don't live there anymore. But um, another thing that even just like the size or population of a place, there's probably a limit to when... You can humanize everyone. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, because the town was so small, you you treated everyone like a person, but at some point you can't care about everyone. Yeah, I think like basically what you're saying is that you can't have those really authentic, genuine interactions with so many people. So as people start moving to this community or as it starts expanding, eventually that really community orientedness is going to break off into like subgroups yes mm -hmm. hmm. interesting <laughs> <laughs> so uh wolf did a follow-up study in 1992 and at that time the town had become less co cohesive more americanized so exactly what we're talking about um more nuclear families i think that's the word right Versus a single family. Yeah. Well, so it wasn't nuclear families before? I, I just mean so that they were all like, it's kind of like a village is raising the kid. You know what I mean? That's what I thought. Okay, because like a this. nuclear family means like a man and a wife and their kids. Yeah, that's what I mean now. Is that it's more just them. That's their family. Yeah, they I know, but people themselves. usually refer to nuclear family when they're speaking about... A family that is not inclusive of like same gendered parents and stuff. So it's a little. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> Good to well, know. it's like when you talk about a nuclear family, you're talking about like the old school family, which is not accepting to those different kind of structure dynamics. Okay. So. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. But um, with this less cohesive society town, the mortality rate increased. Mm. Yeah. So I'm guessing they had more stress and in turn more, more decreases in health, physical health, I guess. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm going to get this word right. This conclusion supports the Edomic, Udom. Demononic? <laughs> it supports the claims they made. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of happiness that is increased because of self-realization. So. What? I'm sorry. Didn't quite follow that. The Edomic theory, which was like the self-realization, finding meaning to life. Okay. Finding meaning. I don't remember you using the term self-realization before, but that's probably just because it's late at night. <laughs> I don't know. If <laughs> like, I did, did I completely? Was like, did I completely miss something? I probably did. It's probably <laughs> me. So that uh, makes me think, though, what Facebook's trying to do with their like idea of the metaverse. Mm -hmm. you, you know, have you seen the videos on that? Yeah, I have, but maybe some of our listeners haven't. Well, the metaverse, if you haven't heard of it, is like this. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. If you've been living under a rock, <laughs> is a online like community where you have virtual avatars. And supposedly you can 
just go into different rooms. You can create rooms and all chat with people. Um, the one thing I thought was creepy though, was that you can have relatives or friends and stuff like that that have passed away and they can live in the metaverse with you. Ew. I think that's kind of creepy. That actually. sounds very black boxy. <laughs> <laughs> so I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to create community, but at the same time, screw Mark Zuckerberg. He's probably getting taken down now. That ain't the community we want. We want a community around pasta and cheese. <laughs> mm, best and cheese. <laughs> so they did another study at Harvard to find out what creates happiness. It's called the Grant and Gleck study. It's two separate studies that ran simultaneously and they followed uh, participants for 75 years. 75 years. Wow. That's a pretty like unique study then. Yeah. At what age did they start following people? So um, the Grant study followed 268 Harvard educated men who graduated from 1942 to 44. Okay. Yes. At the same time, the Gleck study followed 456 disadvantaged non-delinquent inner city youth. Here's what they found from the Grant and Gleck studies. Number one, alcohol was the main cause of divorce and earlier death. Mm, okay. And another interesting one was warmth of relationships, not the IQ, was a better predictor of salaries. And so just to confirm, these findings are from both of the studies. So in both of the very different demographics of men and youth that were being studied, these results were accurate for both. Yes. Okay. Um. So what they found, what it says is that they, the men who had better relationships with their moms earned $87,000 a year more than their counterparts. That is a substantial difference. Yes, it's hard to believe. Mm -hmm. Later in life, they had higher levels of effectiveness at work. And that's when they had better relationships with their moms. So later in life, it helps. So clearly it's very important to have good relationships with your mom. Mm -hmm. Now, relationships with their fathers lowered the rates of adult anxiety. Hmm. Greater enjoyment of vacations. <laughs> <That's> so random. <laughs> Who chose that question to study? <laughs> An increased life satisfaction at 75 years old. Hmm. Well, that's nice. So have good relationships with both parents. It will pay off. Yes. Worth it. Or maybe this is advice to parents. Try to make sure you have good relationships with your kids. Mm -hmm. If you want to invest in them, invest in them with a happy, healthy, loving relationship. Yes. And who knows? They might earn $87,000 a year more than their counterparts. <laughs> Well, imagine what $87,000 a year more would be now versus then. It's a lot of moolah. Mm -hmm. So out of all the stuff they found, they concluded that life satisfaction and health is important or due to the warmth of relationships. That was the biggest hands down factor. So they are actually doing a Harvard second generation study where they're looking at the the kids of these people and a newer newer generation. Hmm. Okay. I wonder if we'll be alive when those results come out. <laughs> I guess we'll see. <laughs> but it is it's another 75 year study and <coughs> I can't remember the date it started, but it was recently, so maybe we'll make it. So this leads us into our next topic, effective state theory. Effective state theory. 
I don't think I've ever heard of this before, so I'm excited to learn. Have you heard of state-dependent memory? Nope. I, I, was, could, I could make an assumption of what it is, but I've not officially heard of it. Well, they're different. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's, they're easily... I, I was figuring that people will get confused easily because that's one state-dependent memory is most often talked about. Like I would assume that state-dependent memory is when your memories, uh, how you remember them is like determined by the current state that you're in or the state you're in when you created the memory. Yeah, and um, your memory's better if you're in that state of mind again, if that makes sense. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like if you're chewing gum while you're studying, you should mm. chew that same gum while you write the test. <laughs> <laughs> yes. During my undergrad, I actually used to go to, not all the time, but when I could in my schedule, I would go to my classrooms that I had the class in and sit in my desk that I would sit in during class and that I would sit in when I wrote my exams and I would study and rewrite my notes in that position. I think it might have had a part in helping me. Never know. It's like my song. I always have a song that it ends up changing every few months, but it's a song I play before every time I need to focus. <laughs> it's true. He does. <laughs> and I will just blast it and play it like three or four times. And then I'm in the zone. And he'll dance to it. <laughs> I don't dance. <laughs> so, effective state theory falls closely with uh, hedonic theories of well being. That's attaining pleasure and avoiding pain. Basically, happiness coincides with your overall emotional state. So, seems pretty logical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, so, in 1969, a man by the name of Norman Bradburn expanded this as positive effect and negative effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, to sum it up quickly, positive effect is an individual's tendency to experience positive emotions when dealing with life's challenges. So, that looks like optimism, extroversion, success, finding fulfillment in things. And contrary to that is the negative effect, is thinking negative, having negative feelings about your environment. Yeah, well, that basically is the same versions as what you were talking about at the start of the episode when you gave me like the two options for what happiness means. And the one was focusing your day on like potential negative things that could happen and the other one was focusing on like the self-realization and meaningful interactions and relationships so this is sounds to me kind of like the exact same ideas but just with different names again pretty much yeah nice <laughs> repackaged with a pretty mm -hmm. bow <laughs> i think this guy chose better names for it though <laughs> uh so according to this theory positive effect influences a happier and less stressful life this fosters resiliency by making it possible to deal with life stresses and so i think a lot of the time people can get stuck in when they, you have a really bad day <laughs> and then you say to yourself like oh i have to deal with this now so it makes the day even harder it's true, 100%. Even if you're trying not to focus on it, if something really disruptive or, you know, sad happens during your day, it can be really hard to get back into, like, the right state of mind. Like, the other day, I had so many things on the schedule that I wanted to get done, and then I came home from grocery shopping, and one of my friends sent me some, like, really negative news, and... Like, the day was shot. Like, no matter how much I knew in my mind and kept saying to myself, like, you need to get back to work, you need to get things done. Nope. And Julian is a great partner and just accepted that and helped me to feel better and have an easier rest of the day and not feel guilty for not getting the stuff done I should have. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Doesn't matter. 
So I guess part of that too is I do this and I've been told by other people, they, they call it destination happiness. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's like, you're just looking for a different situation. Like you would say, well, if only this happened instead, I would be happy now. Well, that sounds exactly like grass is always greener on the other side. Like you're always mm -hmm. thinking it's better over there, better for someone else. Boo hoo hoo. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like someone has a negative effect. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go around telling people, hey, watch their negative effect. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Keep your negative effect from me, buddy. <laughs> you ain't affecting me. My positivity repels. <laughs> but I guess, so obviously, this isn't the only theory on happiness. Um, but part of it kind of points towards like gratitude practices. Mm, I love that. Because you know how, like, that's like the. <laughs> The cliche advice for mental health is, well, just meditate and think about the things that make you happy in your life or you're, um, you're proud of, all this different stuff. And, well, it's supposed to, like, trick your mind into thinking happy thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, every cliche, I would say, probably comes from some truth. So I think there is some validity to those practices and trying to ground yourself yeah oh 100 <laughs> percent. but um so to that same extent that um the gratitude practices work it also works in settings such as like sports i don't know if you've like heard the concept of like the winner's mindset or like the loser's mindset where the winners think they're going to win <laughs> and the losers just already gave up. Like if you already think you're a loser before you go into the match, you're going to lose. We were actually watching this movie last night, movie recommendation, Queen Pins. So good. Such a funny movie. And they talked about this in that movie. <laughs> Don't you remember? Um, they were talking about how, they're winners and they have the winner mindset. Mm. And if you have the winning mindset, the only thing you can do is win. <laughs> yes. I Yeah, I remember that now. <laughs> I forgot to look up. She was an Olympic speedwalker. Yeah. I forgot to look that it's Isn't actually that an event. Real? I don't know. I don't know. It said the movie was based on real events. So I don't know why they would randomly make this lady an Olympic speedwalker. <laughs> that wasn't a real thing. Someone in the comments, if you know whether Olympic speed walking is a real thing, please let us know because we're very interested. <laughs> Not interested enough to Google it ourselves, yeah. but interested. So I'm, I'm speaking to you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, please let us know. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is true, though. It's like, and then there's that... Um, tough point when you're like facing another team that has that winner's mindset we just get broken and it seems like it's some teams just go downhill and it's all negative effect from there yeah i think that's the problem if you are someone who has like a winner's mindset that if you get like anything chipped away from you at all it would just crush you like if you had a healthy mindset that wasn't a winner or wasn't a loser mindset but was more well balanced you know, something positive happens. That's nice, but it doesn't suddenly like, you know, make you feel invincible. Something negative happens. Oh, that's okay. We'll do better next time. Hopefully mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't make you feel like the world's just falling out from under you. Yeah. I, gu I guess you can be, you can have a winner's mindset, I guess, but still have a negative effect. Because if you had a positive effect as a, as a winner that has a mindset like that, you would look at it as, as a challenge that you can improve yourself from or you'll learn from kind of thing. So frame it positively. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. So I have talked a few times about Viktor Frankl. A few times. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't read his book, it's awesome. 
man's search for meaning. He's got a few of them, but I would say I would recommend it. It's uh, he's a psychologist that was in an internment camp in uh, Germany. I think it was. Um, so he, a lot of his, he developed logotherapy and he developed it by watching inmates with them or captives and the guards. And that's where he developed his whole, um, theory on happiness and his quote from one of his lectures is just this <laughs> to the European. It is a characteristic of the American culture that again and again, one is commanded and ordered to be happy, but happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. One must have reason to be happy. Facts. <laughs> Dropping <laughs> words. <laughs> that immediately when I read that was like when people give advice is like, oh, have you tried thinking happy thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't be so negative. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's not so simple as having a positive effect or a negative effect. But I think we'll figure that out how to how to fix that in a, yeah, in a little bit. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just kind of, it really feeds into this idea where people mean nothing but goodness when, you know, someone passes or something happens and people are like, oh, they're in a better place or something like that, right? But those kind of things don't really mean anything if someone doesn't feel like they have a reason to feel happy. Like, you telling them, oh, they're in a better place isn't going to make them actually start to feel good. Or, yeah, telling them, like, think happy thoughts. That's not going to make them feel good. <laughs> well, and exactly what I just said before about destination happiness. It's you can't just think yourself into being happy. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And with the gratitude practices, it's meditation and grounding yourself and processing your emotions. Because you can't just, if you could just create emotions on demand, that would be pretty cool. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> if you could, everyone would do it. Just, uh, what, what's that cartoon? The, it's not the emoji cartoon. It's where there are a bunch of little, um, blobs that are, one's angry, one's sadness. Dang, we loved that movie. We watched it twice. Mm -hmm. Oh, geez, Louise. I can't remember. Blue. Oh my gosh. This is going to bother me. Google it. We're taking a Google break. Inside Out. Inside Out, yes. Yeah. I didn't have to Google that. <laughs> my brain was faster than Google. Yeah, that movie's really good. If you want to start having conversations with your kids about how to understand and I don't think control is really the right, right term to use, but yeah, just really understand and learn how to work with their different emotions that they experience. Such a good movie to do that. Identify their emotions. Even for adults too. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of adults could use this movie, myself included. The thing about that movie I really liked was the, um, what do they call it? The main memories. Mm -hmm. That if one of the main memories broke, that's when they broke down. Yeah. Yeah. Cause those main memories are what forms who they are as a person. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. That was actually pretty cool from a, a kid's movie. <laughs> yeah. Now I want to rewatch it again. So if you can't just think yourself into happiness, what do you think you can do to find happiness? <laughs> find activities that are meaningful and people you can have meaningful relationships with. Mm. Meaningful hobbies and meaning 
full relationships. Yes. You are. So live with meaning. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So I actually, um, a few years ago when I was like fairly depressed and anxious, all this, mm-hmm. all this different stuff. Um, someone asked what I do for my hobbies. I was like, well, I like doing this. I like doing this. It was like, I like going to the gym. I like playing volleyball. I like playing video games. And they're like, okay, so when was the last time you did any of those? (laughs) Uh, Damn, you got me there. (laughs) So I actually, I like to put this into practice. Obviously, I don't do it all the time. But every once in a while, it's good to remind myself that I need to do my hobbies. And it helps with my well-being. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's hard to be happy if you just go to work and then go home and have nothing to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Which is why you're going to start playing guitar again. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. I was thinking. Well, I was having so much fun listening to you in the background when you were playing it. <laughs> so I will start then. Perfect. Tomorrow morning. We're putting it on the list. I did have a bet. I'll say it on here too. So it even has more validity. Okay. That thing I said that I would learn to play guitar and I would play in the Dundas Square. Yeah, Julian has this. He told me before we move out of Toronto, he is going to play music in Dundas Square. Yes. So that means... Whether it sucks or whether it's great, he's doing it. (laughs) I have to play no matter what. So now you guys can all hold me accountable. And by you guys, it's probably just our family. <laughs> if they're even listening. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'll take video evidence of it either way. Mm-hmm. And we'll be uploading that online. Okay. This might be years down the road, but yeah, it'll happen. <laughs> um, so part of those like starting habits, I think one thing that's really important is don't go all out. Right off the bat. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't burn yourself out trying to build a habit and it becomes not maintainable. Well, yeah. Even even if you love, so say love something to do something, it gets old really quick if you just do it constantly. Or it's really hard to do something when there's a little bit of uh, work to it. Like... If you're going to start going to the gym to help your well-being, it's, I mean, right off the bat, you're probably like, okay, I'm going every day. (laughs) I'm going right at 6 a.m. in the morning. But (laughs) chances are, I bet you three days later, (laughs) the majority of people are like, yeah, no, I'm going to sleep in today. Mm -hmm. So like us. (laughs) (laughs) Start small. Actually, I've done this numerous times even before i met gianna that as i would like go to the gym for a while and i've always been athletic and played sports then i would stop going to the gym for like a period of like three months i'd be like oh i need to get back to the gym so i'll be then my mindset was just okay i just need to show up so regardless if i actually worked out every day i just showed up at the gym sometimes i stayed for 10 minutes Sometimes, well, most of the times it was a full workout, but <laughs> <laughs> I at least would show up. Mm-hmm. And that created the habit. Exactly. Me and Julian got into doing that together. The gyms were closed here now for the last month or so in Toronto, and they just opened up this last week. And so, but before then, we had gotten into really good habits and we were mm-hmm. going every single day. Some days we were just going swimming. Swimming opens Monday. Yeah, swimming opens on Monday. So looking forward to that. (laughs) I've never been a swimmer. I'm like having so much fun with it. Oh my goodness. We're like swimming nerds now. Is that a thing? (laughs) We like invested in all of the proper gear for swimming. (laughs) And it's so much fun. We look (laughs) disgusting. (laughs) I'm like, good thing I already got this ring. Because I don't know (laughs) if he would be feeling the same way (laughs) after seeing me with my cap and goggles and nose plug it's quite the look (laughs) oh but yeah anyways i don't even know where i was going with this but it's a 
good habit to have. And so now that gyms are back open, we're looking forward to getting out and doing that again because it was a long break without it after we had finally built that into our routine so well. But now that we haven't been able to go for the last month or so, the idea of going back, I'm like, ah, I don't want to wake up because we go at 730. At least that's the habit we were in. And so I'm not looking forward to being ready to go to the gym that early again. But I believe in us. We can do it. Yeah. You got to do it for the wedding. (laughs) Got to do it for the wedding. So other than creating these habits and stuff, I... So other than creating these habits, another um, really cool piece of advice I got was do spontaneous activities. I love that. Yes. It kind of like, especially if you have an addictive personality, it kind of satisfies satisfies the need for like excitement and having fun and stuff. Yeah, I guess I like adrenaline rush Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So it's good. That's a good one. Even like, I don't know. Even doing a car ride. (laughs) Yeah, we like to do that sometimes, especially with COVID going on right now. And you don't really have a lot of opportunities to do certain things. So we're kind of in our condo by ourselves a lot. And so often we'll just look at each other and be like, walk or car ride (laughs) and just get out of the condo and get some fresh air, see the city listen to some tunes, basically just try and get a different environment. Yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So another way that you can become more happy is remember positive experiences. And by this, I mean, take pictures of the times that make you happy. Interesting. (laughs) For those who are only listening to the audio and are not watching our YouTube channel, you should go watch our YouTube channel. You can watch us sitting on our couch being little weirdos (laughs) trying to (laughs) look normal. But we are gazing creepily at our photo wall behind us right now, which is filled with photos of memories that make us happy. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Good memories. So doing that and reminiscing. (coughs) To doing that and reminiscing. (laughs) (laughs) And so another way that I thought reminiscing would be useful is, you know, like at funerals, you often people talk about the best times that this person had in their life Mm -hmm. and it kind of reshapes how you view the person and how you view life. (laughs) Yeah. So doing that in your life helps remind you that there is positive things. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you are only reflecting back on negative memories from certain periods in your life, those entire periods will start to have this kind of negative connotation surrounding them. But And the reality is, yeah, sure, there might be some periods in certain people's lives that really rightfully are, you know, negative. But there definitely is some truth to the fact that you can, there definitely is some truth to the fact that you can kind of determine what your own perception is of, especially like if you're thinking of longer periods of time. Like for me, if I think about when I lived in Montreal, Well, it could go one or two ways. I could think about the three months when I lived there and I got to spend, you know, amazing quality time with some of my classmates and my friends I made there. Or I can think about my time in Montreal being the two years of lockdowns and not getting to be in person in school and interacting with people. So for me, I like to just focus on those really positive three months that I had there. (laughs) Hey, and then you met me. (laughs) And then I met you. (laughs) Stole me away. So when you have negative experiences, 
Sometimes they're unavoidable. The way to counteract that is don't just vent, but problem solve. It's often it kind of just, I don't know. If I was to just vent, I just, it doesn't really solve anything. I just get like more angry almost. Mm -hmm. I would say venting has its place, but it shouldn't become the main narrative. Like you definitely, I totally agree that there's a space where you sometimes just need to unload your emotions and how you're feeling about something. But that should be one of the more immediate responses. And then, you know, later on mm -hmm. after you've had that opportunity to have like that kind of emotional flood. <laughs> yeah. Process it. Yeah. Processing. Then it should definitely move on to the next stage of problem solving and not stay stuck in that negative space. Or some kind of, some people just like seem to like always want to vent. It's either, it's almost like they gossip. They're like, oh my God, this person did this. And it's constantly, it's all you hear with them. Yeah, for sure. And Which is why. Yeah. <laughs> it's very <laughs> negative. <laughs> we don't love the negativity. Nope. We'll avoid it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that wraps up this episode. What? It is. I it wasn't is ready to be done. I want to talk about more happiness. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do a second episode then. Okay. I like talking about happiness. <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of theories on happiness and a lot of the theories in psychology even they can be like they like put a new uh new skin on the theory and it's like, <laughs> oh, this is actually a theory on happiness now. <laughs> change a few words yeah <laughs> well if anyone has any questions about happiness have any studies related to happiness or interesting stories you want to share with us please do because we can certainly try to include that if we do a future episode related to happiness again and also be sure to check out our other social media channels so we have the podcast available on all platforms that have podcasts <laughs> and we have our video versions on YouTube. We have Instagram where we do kind of behind the scenes and blooper content because just me, we always have bloopers <laughs> and Facebook is kind of a crazy place where we just post everything and Twitter is where we post links to research and stuff that's going on. So join us in any of those spaces. We would love to see you there. And if you like uh, listening to our conversations, please let us know by rating the podcast on whatever platform you're listening from. Yes, we would totally appreciate that. Be awesome. <laughs> we just need one review. <laughs> yeah, one person validate us and make us know we're not just talking into the abyss. Talking to the, the red lights. Although it really doesn't matter because we would be having these conversations with each other anyways. Yeah. Regardless, we could get four listeners <laughs> over the course of a year and I'd still do this. So yeah, exactly. I'm having fun with it. We might not set up all of the cameras and the ring lights and talk into the microphone, <laughs> but the content would be pretty much the same. Yeah. Speaking of that, we'll be posting every Tuesday. So make sure you hit subscribe, follow, and set that auto download so you don't miss an episode. <laughs> Awesome. Well, see ya. Bye. <laughs>